Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Real, as well as being an excellent communicator of mathematics, uh, both to the public and to graduate students. Emily has vice, vice captain the US Women Australian Rules mm -hmm. Football Team. Today, she will be speaking to us about her joint work with Dominic Verity, the formal theory of infinity categories. So take it away, Emily. Great, thanks for that introduction. Uh, and I appreciate you all being here. I know this is an awkward time for most of us. So I tried to pick uh, colors, a color theme that feels to me like Friday night, you know? So, um, right. So uh, the title of the talk is The Formal Theory of Infinity Categories. By infinity categories, you should be thinking about infinity one categories. So these are kind of weak, infinite dimensional analogs of ordinary categories. And um, in case you might want to learn something about them, because it is an active research area, I thought uh, the goal of this talk would be to try and develop as much of the theory of infinity categories as possible in 50 minutes. So, um, so uh, I'm imagining that, uh, well, well, the idea is that uh, analogs of um, theorems in ordinary category theory hold true for these infinity categories because after all they are in close analogy. So um, to state and prove those theorems, we need to start with the definitions of, you know, sort of the basic things from category theory. So like adjunctions between categories or limits and co-limits inside of categories. Uh, the definitions are a little bit more delicate in the infinity categorical world. And um, the plan today is to just sort of get as far into that basic theory as possible, um, sort of starting from scratch. And uh, the way this is going to work is uh, we're going to really lean into the philosophy of category theory to develop the theory of infinity categories. So forget right now that the type of thing we're trying to study is something called an infinity category. And just imagine uh, that it's any sort of mathematical object. So the philosophy of category theory tells us is if that you want to learn about some type of mathematical objects, you can do this by studying the category in which those objects live. Um, you can use things like universal properties to uh, characterize interesting features of a particular object and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So um, the key fact that we'll need that'll support all the theorems of this talk until the very end when we prove this fact is that uh, there is a well-defined two category um, that is Cartesian closed, so it has uh, products and internal homs, a terminal object. Uh, there's a well-defined two category whose objects are infinity categories, whose one cells are the maps between them, the infinity version of functors, and whose two cells we're going to call infinity natural transformations. So the setting for everything that I'm going to say is a two category, and I really do mean a two category, not a bi category. Um, you can uh, construct, and I'll explain this at the very end, a two category, like the two category of categories, functors, and natural transformations, except in this case, the objects are infinity categories, and the one cells are infinity functors, and the two cells are infinity natural transformations. Okay, so before I go on, let me uh, sort of just comment about a two category. So, it, you know, a two category is like an ordinary category. We have the objects and the morphisms, and the notation, of course, for morphisms is uh, chosen to be suggestive of composition. So the key property of functors between infinity categories being morphisms in a category is that given a composable pair, there's a composite. Um, of course, this is subject to the orientation. So if I had drawn G pointing the other way, then you wouldn't expect a composite anymore. And the same thing is going to be true for the two cells in the two category. So uh, a natural transformation, you might remember, is something that requires first specifying two categories, then a parallel pair of functors, and uh, then a natural transformation is understood as some sort of two-dimensional morphism between these one-dimensional morphisms between these objects. So that's, that's sort of the boundary type for an infinity natural transformation. It's exactly the same as for an ordinary natural transformation. So um, I find this a useful way uh, to draw uh, infinity natural transformations. Um, you, you could sort of depict them in line by drawing something that looks like this, but uh, this sort of uh, two-dimensional notation is uh, useful. And the reason that it's so useful is it's suggestive of the ways that such things can be composed. 
So um, for instance, uh, I could, if I encountered another uh, infinity natural transformation that I could stick on the bottom of this, I'm, I'm just introducing composition in the two category for those who aren't familiar with it. So if I had another infinity natural transformation that uh, I could stick up on this, um, just sort of looking at this picture, um, you might expect there to be a composite uh, of alpha and beta, a so-called vertical composite, whose uh, one cell source would be F and whose one cell target would be H. And indeed, that is true. That's This is all tied up in the assertion that I have a two category whose uh, two cells are these infinity natural transformations. And then there's another sort of composition operation. So I'll redraw my alpha. If I uh, were presented with another infinity natural transformation, say gamma, here, um, then again, in this configuration, just your visual intuition would suggest that there might be a composite whose horizontal source, in this case, is the composite KF, and whose horizontal target is the composite LG. And then uh, this is some sort of horizontal composite of alpha with gamma. And uh, more generally, there's this notion of a pacing diagram, which I'm not going to define for you, but you can maybe recognize if you see one uh, or sort of guess that you've seen one if you've seen one. As long as you have some uh, configuration of these two cells, in this case, these infinity natural transformations where everything's sort of compatibly oriented. So uh, we have um, a source object A, a target object D, all of the one cells sort of point in paths from A to D, and then all of the two cells point in a compatible direction, again, there is a, a well-defined composite. So we're going to use this sort of notation as opposed to kind of string diagram notation or inline notation for the infinity natural transformations because it's really suggestive of the composition, and that's something we're going to use heavily. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and give it a go. So our aim is to develop the theory of infinity categories, and we're going to start with the notion of an adjunction between infinity categories. And the reason that this is a useful place to start is there's a definition of adjunction that I can take off the shelf um, from the fact on the previous slide. So because we know that infinity categories are the objects in some two category of infinity categories, infinity functors, infinity natural transformations, there's a standard definition of adjunction that you can define in any two category. And when we apply that definition in this particular two category, it looks as follows. And this is how we're going to define an adjunction between infinity categories. So an adjunction is given by the data of a pair of infinity categories, a pair of infinity functors, a pair of infinity natural transformations. These are traditionally called the unit and the co-unit. And uh, here, eta is a natural transformation whose source functor is the identity. I've just drawn it with an equals sign and whose target functor is the composite of F followed by U. So eta goes from the identity on B to UF, and epsilon goes from uh, U followed by F, so FU to the identity on A. And then there's an equation um, that you might have seen written in a different way, but I'm going to express as pasting diagrams. So what the equation says is that if I paste eta and epsilon together in either of the two natural configurations, if I look at this diagram on the left, what this is defining for me is a composite two cell whose source is identity followed by F, or really just the functor F, and whose target is F followed by identity, so really just the functor F. And the requirement is that that composite is itself the identity two cell on F, which I've depicted in this degenerate way. And similarly, uh, if I compose the other way around, now this gives us a natural transformation from U to U, the requirement is that is again the identity. So these pasting diagrams are ways to express the triangle of identities that you might have seen written in line, uh, sort of looking something more like this. If I have the identity natural transformation, I have uh, F eta, epsilon F, I can express this commutativity condition by this pasting diagram. This equality corresponds to the fact that this top composite is equal to the bottom composite. Okay, so this is the standard definition of a junction between infinity categories. I'm uh, maybe relying on my authority as somebody who works in this area to tell you that this is in fact the correct definition. This uh, agrees with other definitions that other uh, folks have proposed. Um, but 
what's wonderful about it is you don't just want to know what adjunctions are, you want to know how adjunctions behave. You want to prove a number of results concerning adjunctions. And because we've taken our definition of adjunction between infinity categories off the shelf, we can take a number of proofs off the shelf as well to develop the basic theory of adjunctions between infinity categories. We're going to do so now. Um, let me just note briefly the adjunct, the notation. So I use this little turn style where the flat bit points to the right adjoint and the pointy bit points to the left adjoint. Okay, so first basic result about adjunctions is that they compose. So if I have an adjunction where the left adjoint points, or let's say the right adjoint points from A to B, and then another adjunction where the right adjoint points from B to C, then I can compose these functors and there is a composite adjunction. All right, so what's the proof? So I need to claim that f, f prime, u prime, u are adjoint functors, I need to define a unit and co-unit for this composite adjunction, which I've done by these pasting diagrams. I've just kind of arranged one on top of the other. I'm taking the advantage that I can sort of stick an identity in somewhere. And then I need to prove the two pacing equalities, the two triangle identities. And I'll just do one of these. So I'm going to redraw the unit here. So the our definition of the unit in the uh, new composite adjunction is as follows. I paste the unit for uh, f prime left adjoint to u prime on the top of the unit of uh, f left adjoint to u. And then I'll uh, juxtapose with the co-unit, which we've defined again by pasting together these two co-units. So this was the definition of the unit, the definition of the co-unit in the composite adjunction. Now the requirement is that this pasted composite needs to be the identity to cell on the functor f, f prime. Um, but a thing about pacing composition that I uh, maybe didn't quite sufficiently emphasize is that it, it really is well-defined in a two category. So I could uh, sort of compose up these cells in whatever order I want. So in particular, if I look at the bottom of the configuration, I see from the triangle identity for the adjunction where f is left adjoint to u, that the bottom composite is just the identity on this bottom functor f. Similarly, the top composite by the triangle identity for that adjunction is equal to the identity on this functor f prime, and the identities compose two identities. That's another one of the axioms of a two category. And I could do a similar calculation on the other side for the other triangle equality. So um, indeed, the adjunctions do compose. And this is a sort of two categorical diagrammatic proof. This is kind of the two category analog of the proof technique of diagram chasing. OK, arguing similarly, we can prove a second useful fact about adjunctions, which is sort of the essential uniqueness of adjoints. So um, if I start with an adjunction, f is the left adjoint to u, then, and I have another functor f prime, then the claim is that that other functor f prime is also left adjoint to u if and only if f and f prime are isomorphic. So this is a uniqueness of, of a junction. So if I have an adjunction and then an isomorphic functor, I get a new adjunction. And if I have two left adjoints to the same functor, then those two left adjoints are isomorphic. So let's start by proving that first. So if I'm given two left adjoints, f and f prime to the same functor u, then I have two units and co-units. I'm going to use eta and epsilon for the units and co-units of the first adjunction, and eta prime and epsilon prime for the units and co-units of the second adjunction. And by pasting them together, I can obtain a two cell. So here I've pasted eta, the unit of the first adjunction, with epsilon prime, the co-unit of the second adjunction. This composite defines a two cell whose source is f prime and whose target is f. And similarly, this pasted composite on the right defines another two cell whose source is f this time and whose target is f prime. Uh, the claim is that these are inverses. So this I can check by just uh, doing a calculation. I'll, I mean, I should really check that they're two-sided inverses. So I want to paste them together in both directions. But let me just do one of the two calculations. So here I've got my uh, map from f prime to f, which I'll put on the left. And I'm going to put on the right uh, the map, the two cell from f to f prime. Okay, uh, so this is the two cell from f to f prime followed by the two cell from f prime to f. But now by the triangle equality, I'm going to be able to cancel these interior two cells. This is using one of the triangle identities for the second of the two adjunctions. 
So I can cancel in the sense of replacing it by an identity. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. Um, so after replacing the interior two cells by an identity, I'm left with this configuration, but this just involves the unit and the co-unit of the second adjunction. And indeed, uh, that is equal to the identity on F. So this is the proof that uh, this thing followed by this thing is the identity. And you can see that if I had done this the other way, I would uh, get the corresponding result. So that's proving the isomorphism. And similarly, uh, now let's suppose if I have just the single adjunction and uh, the data of an invertible two cell. So I'm using this uh, congruence notation to indicate that gamma is a two cell from F to F prime that has an inverse, an inverse for the vertical composition. Um, then I can use that data to define a uh, unit and co-unit for an adjunction. Um, so here, this is going to be a unit, uh, maybe I'll call it eta prime, and this is going to be a co-unit, maybe I'll call it epsilon prime uh, for a new adjunction. I guess I wrote that already there, so I don't need to say that again. Um, and so what I need to do, well, I need to check again the triangle equalities. So, um, I mean, one of the checks uh, involves uh, just sort of pacing them in one order. So if I have, sorry, this, this goes in this direction. So if I have my uh, eta prime, uh, which is defined in this way, and then I paste it next to uh, epsilon prime, which is defined in this way, uh, then um, what do I get? So by the first triangle identity, again, this stuff in the middle cancels. And what I'm left with is uh, gamma inverse followed by gamma, which of course is again the identity. So uh, this is the identity on F prime. And so that's uh, one of the two triangle equalities. And I'll leave you to do the other calculation because I'm out of space. But again, it's uh, sort of a two categorical pasting diagram chase. Okay, great. And uh, so the next result uh, about adjunctions is uh, something I didn't actually know about them right away. This is uh, something that John Burke told me about in an email, so I'll thank him for this. Um, this is a lemma that describes the minimal adjunction data in a sense. And so it says that if I have a pair of functors, U and F, so again, we're talking, we're developing infinity category theory in case you've forgotten. Uh, so uh, a and B are infinity categories, U and F are functors between infinity categories. If I'm given a pair of functors, then these define an adjunction with F the left adjoint, if and only if there exist uh, infinity natural transformations, so two cells, this eta prime and this epsilon prime, so that the composites, and what I've written here are the triangle identity composites, I've written them out in the inline way just to save a little space, are both invertible. So the definition of an adjunction involves uh, a pair of functors, a pair of uh, natural transformations, infinity natural transformations, so that these composites are identities. What this lemma is saying is that if you assume less, if you assume um, it, that these are only invertible, um, then that suffices to uh, witness the fact that F is indeed the left adjoint. This eta prime and this epsilon prime won't be the unit and co-unit anymore because they don't quite satisfy the required identity. But you can get away, as the proof is going to reveal, with modifying just one of them, and uh, um, and it will it'll fix things. So let's see how this goes. So um, in the construction I'm going to give, we will keep eta prime, so eta prime will be the unit of the actual adjunction, but where I'm going to modify epsilon prime, so we're going to define a new uh, infinity natural transformation epsilon by taking my epsilon prime, but then composing in, sort of pasting in the inverse of this phi. So this is this second uh, triangle equality composite. So uh, if I do that, then sort of by the way this definition is arranged, I'm going to get one of the two required triangle identities. So to claim that this epsilon and this eta prime satisfy one of the triangle identities, well, the, if we think about the one where I paste eta prime with epsilon, uh, well, um, so this composite in here of eta prime with epsilon prime is by definition phi. So this reduces to, I guess I can squeeze that in, uh, this reduces to, uh, I've got my phi inverse bit hanging out over here, and I have phi here. And of course, phi 
pasted with the inverse uh, gives an identity. So this is the proof of one of the two triangle identities. By modifying epsilon prime in this way to form this new two cell epsilon, if I paste it with eta, I get an identity. Now, if I paste it around the other way, something a little bit more complicated happens. So I, what I would like to show now is that the other triangle identity composite, which is the piece that's in here, I need to show that that is equal to the identity. Um, that's a little difficult to show directly, but if I paste this bit on uh, with eta prime, epsilon prime, uh, well, so if I look at this left-hand side, in the middle, um, I have this part, which I just argued reduces to the identity on F. So um, I'm interested, again, in this part. But if I paste it on with another eta prime and another epsilon prime, I can cancel away this interior part and get just the expression on the left. OK, so let's uh, sort of write that out in another way just so we can see it. So this expression on the left is what I was calling uh, psi. So this is the uh, infinity natural transformation from u to u that's defined by pasting eta prime with epsilon prime. So what we've learned is if I take psi, and then I follow it um, by my uh, candidate triangle equality composite for the thing that I'm hoping is an adjunction. So here, this is uh, eta prime u, and this is u epsilon with the new corrected co-unit epsilon. What I've learned from this pacing equation is that this is equal to uh, psi. But psi is also an isomorphism. So I use the fact that phi is an isomorphism here because I'm explicitly using its inverse cell. Because psi is an isomorphism, it has an inverse, which is going to allow me to cancel this part of the equation and leave, be left with an identity on u here. And that's exactly what I want. So by canceling, I can conclude um, in the second triangle equality. So that's a little bit more delicate of an argument. OK. so. Um, I'll explain in a second the reason why I bothered to prove that lemma, um, and it's going to require a new definition for infinity categories. Um, this is another advantage of thinking about this two category of infinity categories, infinity functors, infinity natural transformations, is I can take, again, off the shelf a definition of something called an equivalence. There's a standard way to define an equivalence inside any two category, and if I interpret that definition in this two category of infinity categories, infinity functors, and infinity natural transformations, it looks like this. So an equivalence between infinity categories is given by a pair of infinity categories, a pair of infinity functors, one from A to B, one from B to A, and then a pair of invertible infinity natural transformations. Here, the orientation of these doesn't matter so much because they are invertible. Um, but one should go from the identity at B to the composite of K followed by H, and the other should go at from the identity at A or to the identity at A from the composite of H followed by K. So that's the standard two categorical notion of equivalence. And what I'm telling you today is that uh, coincides with any other notion of equivalence between infinity categories you might be familiar with. Um, and again, this is a nice definition to have as your first one because uh, it's easy to work with. So uh, classical result in a two category whose proof I can take off the shelf and now apply to infinity category theory is this fact that any equivalence between infinity categories can be promoted to what's called an adjoint equivalence, um, which is uh, a, um, I guess the union or that maybe the intersection of these two definitions. So it's an equivalence that is also an adjunction. And what is the proof? So the idea is I might start with the data of an equivalence, my A, my B, my H, my K, my beta, and my alpha. I'm going to modify either beta or alpha. You get to pick which one, but you do necessarily have to modify one. I'm going to modify one of these invertible two cells to get the unit and co-unit of an adjunction. So it's going to be like an additional compatibility between these. Um, but this follows immediately from the previous lemma. So the previous lemma said my functors H and K are adjoint. And in fact, in any configuration, provided there exist some two cells that have the sort of shape of the unit and the co-unit um, so that the triangle equality composites are invertible. But here, these two cells are themselves invertible. So the triangle equality composites will certainly be invertible. And uh, the construction given in the previous proof could be implemented here, for instance. Yeah. Great. So uh, 
That's an introduction to adjunctions and equivalences, which is a part of uh, basic category theory, but certainly not the only thing. Um, so what I'd like to bring into the story now are limits and colimits. And I'm referring to limits and colimits inside an infinity category. So an adjunction is something that is between infinity categories. What I want to focus on now are limits of colim and colimits of diagrams uh, valued inside an infinity category. So um, classically, I think these would have been referred to as homotopy limits and homotopy colimits, but in the infinity category community, it's more common to just call them limits and colimits because they're the only limits and colimits we have. And you know, one of the selling points about infinity categories, I guess, as a avenue towards abstract homotopy theory is it's you can't really get confused about what sort of limits and colimits you're working with. All limits and colimits are necessarily these homotopy ones because that's sort of the only ones you can define. Okay, I'll just focus on the colimits part of the story, but everything dualizes for limits. So if um, you'd like an exercise, there, there it is. Uh, and we'll start with the first definition. So an infinity category A admits an initial element. So um, you might prefer to call this an initial object, but I, I find objects are sort of overused, so I'm uh, reappropriating the term element, but this is something inside A, an initial element inside A, uh, sort of if and only if the unique functor from A to the terminal infinity category. So this thing here is the terminal infinity category. I said my uh, two category of infinity categories is Cartesian closed, so it has a terminal object. Uh, so this is a terminal infinity category. There's a unique functor then from A to it. So if that has a left adjoint, then this uh, left adjoint defines an initial element of A. So this might seem a little funny. You, you might be expecting the initial element to be something like in A. And what I've written instead is I've given I, I'm using I as the name of an infinity functor from the terminal infinity category into A. Um, but uh, this is sort of using the idea, maybe due to Levere and the category of sets, so I guess I'm sure he's not the only one who's come up with this, that a uh, functor out of a terminal infinity category determines the data of a element inside the infinity category that you're mapping into. So I get to identify um, my elements in an infinity category A with functors of this form and will make use of that identification. Um, and that's useful for us because remember we're trying to, I never really, I never gave you a definition of an infinity category. I didn't really explain what it is. I didn't explain how one could be constructed. So the only way that we could possibly probe inside an infinity category is by looking at other infinity categories and maps to it or maps from it. This is sort of using this UNADA um, philosophy. Um, so uh, these sorts of functors are how we're going to identify elements inside of A. And then the definition is that this is an initial element, sort of if and only if uh, this functor is left adjoint to um, uh, the constant, or the sort of unique functor from A to one. So what's nice about this definition is we've just uh, proven a whole bunch of facts about adjunctions and you can specialize those uh, facts two facts about uh, initial elements. So it follows, for instance, that uh, two initial elements are isomorphic in the sense of being connected by an invertible two cell. Um, so that's that's cool. But let's go ahead and move on to the harder thing. Um, so I wanna think about initial elements are co-limits of the empty diagram. Uh, so a special thing about this terminal infinity category is it's, uh, isomorphic to the infinity category that you get by uh, applying the internal HOM. So I'm working again in a Cartesian closed two categories. So if I have two infinity categories, I can take uh, the infinity category of diagrams. And if I map out of the empty one, sort of the initial infinity category, I guess I didn't tell you that that exists, but it does. Um, that's sort of the role played by the terminal infinity category. Um, but uh, sort of using that, we can, we can get to the following generalization. So if J is another infinity category, then I'm going to write A to the J. Again, this is using the Cartesian closed structure on the two category of infinity categories uh, for the infinity category 
of J-shaped diagrams in A. So that's how we should think of it, diagrams in A. Um, maybe a thing to observe is that if we look at an element here, I might write this element as a D. By the Cartesian closed structure, this is going to correspond to something from J times one, or really just from J into A. So that's the sense in which this is the infinity category of J-shaped diagrams. Its elements correspond to functors, infinity functors from J and A. Now, another thing we get for free from uh, the Cartesian closed structure is something that I'm gonna call the uh, constant diagram functor. And that's what I'm denoting by this delta. This is the constant diagram functor. So that's something that exists canonically for any a and J, I have uh, this constant diagram functor. It's restriction along the unique map from J to one, if you will. And uh, what it means for an infinity category to have all colimits of shape J is for this functor to have a left adjoint. Uh, the left adjoint would then be the colimit functor. So this is an infinity functor that would take any J-shaped diagram in A to its colimit. Okay. So again, this is cool because we can now leverage stuff that we know already about adjunctions to uh, prove some things about the colimit functor. So for instance, uh, um, if I have an adjunction, say involving F and U, then um, this constant diagram functor commutes with any other functor. I mean, this is again, just a feature of the Cartesian closed structure. So I've got commutative diagram here. Um, but this is a commutative diagram now involving right adjoints. So if I pass to the left adjoints, we have this result that say that uh, left adjoints to a given functor are necessarily isomorphic. So if I consider, and we also have a result that say adjunctions compose. So if I consider the composite right adjoint this way around, that's equal to the composite left right adjoint this way around. If I take the left adjoints then, which I could get by composing, they're necessarily isomorphic. So in that way, I get an invertible two cell in here, which says that if I apply the colimit functor and then apply my left adjoint, it's the same as applying the left adjoint to the diagram and then taking the colimit. So the left adjoints commute with colimit the colimit functor. Um, so that's uh, like a result that uh, you might anticipate. So the problem with this definition is it's not quite sufficiently general. So um, there are infinity categories that will have certain colimits of a particular shape, but not necessarily have all colimits of that shape. And um, for that reason, I want to be able to talk about the colimit of a single diagram without necessarily asserting the existence of a colimit functor for any diagram of a given shape. So we'll be able to do that, but I'm gonna need a slight digression uh, through a bit of two category theory. So remember again, we're working in this ambient two category of infinity categories, infinity functors, infinity natural transformations. This is a definition you can make in, in any two category and we're gonna apply it in a moment in this particular two category. Um, it's, uh, if you're familiar with absolute left con extensions, this is the up dual of that. So I've turned around all the one cells, but not any of the two cells. Anyway, what it is, is it's something called an absolute left lifting. So this is an absolute left lifting of uh, this infinity functor through this infinity functor. Note these have the same codomain. Uh, that's, uh, this A is the same as this A, that's necessary here. So an absolute left lifting of G through F is given by the data of firstly a infinity functor L from C to B. Um, that's sort of the lift, but it's not sort of a strict lift. It's a lift up to an infinity natural transformation that points up. If it had pointed down, that would be the notion of a right lifting, but we'll focus on the left lifting. And then this data, so this pair L and lambda needs to satisfy a universal property. Um, a way to state the universal property and a way we're going to use it later is to say that pasting with lambda defines a bijection in a particular way. Um, but another way to think about it is that if, if I have any uh, infinity natural transformation alpha that sort of fits over this G and F in this way. So I'm introducing an arbitrary infinity category X with a pair of functors B and C and then an uh, infinity natural transformation here. Then this factors uniquely, so this is exists uniquely through uh, infinity natural transformation gamma from LC to B through my lift lambda. 
Okay, so this is the, the universal property. Another way to say it is that pacing with lambda defines a bijection between uh, infinity natural transformations of this form and infinity natural transformations of this form. So pacing with lambda is a map in this direction that defines a bijection. So anything of this form factors uniquely through something of this form. Okay, so let's uh, try and explore this notion. So I'm going to prove a couple basic lemmas about it. So the first says that if I uh, start with an absolute left lifting, so my L and my lambda, and then I restrict along any functor, I still have an absolute left lifting. So if L lambda is the absolute left lifting of G through F, then uh, LC lambda C is the absolute left lifting of GC through F. And this is what absolute means. Absolute is uh, saying that these left liftings are preserved by restriction along any functor. And the proof is essentially just some geometry. So to show the universal property of this thing, what I need to show is that any alpha of this form now factors uniquely through lambda followed by C. But an alpha of this form, I can just compose up this X and the C, these two functors, and then write it as an alpha inhabiting some square. Now I can apply my universal property of my absolute left lifting uh, lambda and get my unique factorization, which then I could uh, sort of rearrange in the form that I need it to. So there's uh, the universal property, the statement of the universal property in this definition of an absolute left lifting makes it immediate. It, it's sort of packaged in such a way so that it follows immediately that this universal property is preserved by restriction along any functor. Okay, so there's one other lemma about these things that we'll make use of, which says that uh, if I'm given the following configuration, uh, and I know that this triangle at the bottom is absolute left lifting, so L is the absolute left lifting of H through F, then the top triangle, so that's this one, is an absolute left lifting, if and only if the composite pasted triangle is an absolute left lifting. So this is a, a sort of a composition and cancellation property that might be familiar in the dual for con extensions, and the proof is the same as the one that you would use there. So I had mentioned that a way to understand uh, the universal property of absolute left lifting is to say that a certain pasting function is a bijection. And so let's consider those pasting functions. So if I have a uh, two cell and infinity natural transformation of the following form, then I could paste kappa on the bottom of it. And if I paste kappa on the bottom, uh, kappa is gonna be something that uh, sort of fits in here. So there's an L and there's a G. So if I pasted kappa on the bottom here, then I get an infinity natural transformation of the form here. So that's the definition of this function. Now, if I uh, pasted uh, lambda on the bottom here, lambda is an infinity natural transformation that fits in this little triangle. If I pasted lambda in the bottom, then I would convert a two cell of this form uh, to a two cell of this form. Or I could just paste kappa compose lambda together and go there at once. So I have this commutative uh, triangle of functions on infinity natural transformations. Now to say that lambda is an absolute left lifting is to say that this function here is a bijection, but because this triangle commutes, this function here is a bijection if and only if this function here is a bijection. And that's the statement, that's the proof of this if and only if. So one final observation, and this is the reason that I'm introducing this notion of absolute left lifting, is there's a connection with uh, the unit of an adjunction. So a natural transformation, eta, which is uh, whose one cell source is the identity at B and whose one cell target is F composed with U, is the unit of an adjunction with F the left adjoint, if and only if this is an absolute left lifting. So if eta and F is an absolute left lifting of the identity through you. And uh, this is, again, just another sort of two categorical diagram chase, another pasting diagram chase, or a way, maybe a high level way to think about this is to say that this is absolute left lifting is to say that the function that takes a two cell of this configuration and paste on eta at the bottom, so paste on eta like this, uh, this is this function is a bijection, that's the uh, statement of this being an absolute left lifting, 
But if we think about what this bijection is, this is the adjoint transposition bijection. So I could uh, redraw alpha in a way that'll make it look a little bit familiar like this. And I can redraw beta. Uh, sorry, that's a typo here. Um, this should be uh, U. I could redraw beta in a way uh, that makes it look a little bit more familiar like this. And this is the usual formula for adjoint transposition. It's pacing with the unit. And so to say these are in bijection is saying that if I look at the HOM category from X to B and the HOM category from X to B, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at inside the HOM categories at some HOM sets involving the functors B, uh, sort of F, B, and A, and B, and U, A, um, this is sort of adjoint transposition. So that's another, I'm alluding to a different way to think about what an adjunction in a two category is, sort of a representable way to think about an adjunction. And um, the universal property of being the absolute left lifting is exactly to say that the unit pacing of the unit implements adjoint transposition. Alternatively, you can just do a purely two categorical diagrammatic proof of this. Um, great, so in particular, um, when we were considering what it meant for an infinity category A to have all J-shaped co-elements, uh, the definition we gave previously is that the constant diagram functor admits a left adjoint, which we called the co-limit functor. And uh, so, um, so we can re-express uh, that universal property by saying that the co-limit functor just finds an absolute left lifting of the identity through the constant diagram functor. And now putting all of this together, we have our desired definition of a co-limit of a single diagram in an infinity category. So if I start with a single diagram, so that's uh, just the infinity functor from J to A, uh, I can associate that with an element in the infinity category of diagrams. I'm transposing across the constant diagram functor or sorry, I'm, I'm transposing and using the Cartesian closed structure, and then an absolute left lifting of this through the constant diagram functor would give me some data of this form. And this is what it means to have a co-limit of the diagram. So there's two pieces of data here. This C is an element inside A. That's like the co-limit object, the sort of the, the co-limit object. And then this lambda is giving me an infinity natural transformation from D to the constant J-shaped diagram at C. So this is the colimit cone piece of the story. Um, so that's the sense in which this is giving us the data of a colimit of my diagram D. Um, and uh, an easy lemma, a, a special case of the first lemma I told you about absolute left lifting diagrams is that if A has all J-shaped colimits, so it has this colimit functor, then any diagram has a colimit. And the reason is having the colimit functor means in particular I have the unit of this adjunction. So that's an absolute left lifting diagram. But then when I restrict along any functor, in this case restrict along an element D, I get an absolute left lifting. So this is saying that the colimit object then would be take the colimit functor and evaluate it at D and the colimit cone is to take the unit of the adjunction and take the component of that unit at D. And that is sort of indeed how all of this stuff works. Okay, so I've introduced for you uh, notions of adjunction between infinity categories and notions of colimit inside an infinity category. I'm gonna end this uh, sort of development of the category theory of infinity categories by proving maybe a, a favorite theorem that left adjoints between infinity categories preserve colimits in infinity categories. So there's a more elementary proof of this than the one that I'm giving here, where you just uh, sort of take the universal argument, or sorry, the usual argument where I, you know, consider a cone over a diagram, and I transpose the cone, and I apply the unique factorization, and then I transpose back. You could implement that as a pacing diagram argument, um, but this one's a little bit slicker. Um, we're sort of using the universal property of these absolute left lifting diagrams to avoid the transposition. Um, so what's the statement? So I'm given a co-limit. So uh, here my infinity category is now changed to B. I have a diagram, a J-shaped diagram, uh, D in B. I have a co-limit of it. That is, I have an absolute left lifting like this. So C is the co-limit element, uh, lambda is the co-limit cone. And I'm given an adjunction here. What I want to show is that if I apply my left adjoint F 
to this co-limit diagram. So in other words, I form this configuration here. Uh, this bit actually commutes. Now I have FC is the co-limit of F of D. So in other words, that this is an absolute left lifting. Okay, so how am I gonna prove that this is an absolute left lifting? Well, uh, one thing that I've learned is that uh, using my sort of composition and cancellation lemma for absolute left liftings, to show that this is an absolute left lifting, it suffices to paste on the bottom with a known absolute left lifting diagram and then uh, show that the pasted composite is absolute left lifting. I'm missing a J there. So if I uh, paste on the bottom with the unit of an adjunction, so A to J, uh, ha so having this adjunction here means I also have an adjunction between the diagram infinity categories. This is just applying a two functor, which is exponentiation by J to a given adjunction in a two category. So if I paste this co-limit cone on the bottom with eta, it suffices to show that this thing is an absolute left lifting because I know that A to J is absolute left lifting or really A to J restricted along D is absolute left lifting. Um, this, by the way, is implementing the adjoint transposition step because I'm pasting with the unit of an adjunction is transposing across the adjunction. So now, uh, if I look at the right-hand part of this diagram, um, this constant diagram functor, which uh, came sort of canonically from the Cartesian closed structure uh, on the uh, ambient two category is sort of too natural in the sense that, uh, so I'm, I'm just redrawing the lambda part of the diagram where sort of letting it sit off on its own. I can uh, move my eta j, my uh, co-unit sort of up here at the top of the diagram. And uh, um, so this sort of right-hand piece here is equal to this right-hand piece. This is uh, by the two naturality of the constant diagram functor. And again, this is something just canonical in any Cartesian closed two category. So this configuration is equal to this configuration. And now I'm just gonna, you know, this is an identity here. So I'm just gonna rewrite this in a different way. So at the bottom of this, uh, rearranged version of my pasted composite, I have um, my original uh, uh, co-limit cone. So this is lambda, which is the original co-limit. C is the co-limit of the diagram D. And then on the top, I have the uh, unit of my original junction. So that's here. And now uh, my goal again was to show that this left-hand pasted composite was an absolute left lifting diagram, but it's equal to this right-hand pasted composite. And eta is absolute left lifting as is uh, lambda, lambda being a co-limit cone. And so therefore by the composition cancellation, this is a absolute left lifting diagram. So this is an absolute left lifting diagram. So the piece on top is, so therefore this is an absolute left lifting. Okay, so left adjoints preserve co-limits. All right, so I'm uh, one last thing I owe you. This is my last slide with any content. Uh, so all of this presupposed that we could work in a Cartesian closed two category whose objects are infinity categories, whose one cells are infinity functors and whose two cells are infinity natural transformations. So where did I get that from? So um, if we're sort of being rigorous about infinity categories in the classical foundations of mathematics, i.e. set theory, we need to use uh, various models of infinity categories. And these go by certain names. So um, some of my favorites are quasi-categories, complete Siegel spaces, Siegel categories. So um, various models, not every single model, but um, the sort of well-behaved ones assemble into a Cartesian closed category. So what I mean by this is if you think about the quasi-categories, and the maps between them, the category of such things is a Cartesian closed category. So, um, and moreover, I'm, I'm just writing infinity cat for it, for lack of a better name. More, moreover, this category, so this is an ordinary one category that's Cartesian closed, uh, has an adjunction connecting it to the ordinary categories. So the right adjoint of this adjunction is often called like the nerve embedding. It's the way that strict one categories embed into infinity one categories. The left adjoint is called the homotopy category functor. And uh, both functors in this adjunction preserve products. And what's useful about that is I can use this as some sort of change of base adjunction. I can apply these functors to the HOMs 
of categories that are enriched in these types of categories to change the enrichment. So in particular, if I apply this left adjoint, this product preserving homotopy category functor homwise, what that's going to do is it's going to convert a category that's enriched over infinity categories in whatever model into a category that's enriched over categories in whatever model. And so what's that doing? A category enriched in infinity categories, you can think of as an infinity two category, while a category enriched in ordinary categories is a two category. And I have an example of one of these things. So because infinity cat is Cartesian closed, it is an instance of an infinity cat enriched category. When I apply this homotopy category functor, so I just take the homotopy categories of the HOM infinity categories, I get then a two category. Uh, if I need a notation for it, I might write sort of O star infinity cat. And this is the two category that we've been working in this entire time. Okay, so I want to save some time for questions, so I'll stop there. Um, there's a uh, upcoming book that contains everything that I said here and a whole lot more. And uh, thanks for your attention.